U.S. Supreme Court will hear arguments this fall in cases challenging racial preferences at Harvard University and UNC Chapel Hill. In both instances, plaintiffs believe that the current admissions policies discriminate against Asian American applicants. A new Manhattan Institute report offers some interesting information related to the case, and joining us with details about that report is its author, Robert Verbruggen. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me here. So first of all, what is it that you were looking for as you put together this new report titled Trends in Asian Enrollment at U.S. US Colleges? Sure. Well, if you go back about 10 years, um, right around the time that these lawsuits were being filed, um, one piece of evidence that people were looking at um, was simply the demographics of colleges. It's very hard to get good information on what's going on in college admissions policies because they don't make a lot public. They don't make a lot of public and they don't make a lot of information available to researchers. So one of the few things you can look at is the demographics of colleges and how they change over time. And a number of people have pointed out that, especially at very elite colleges, Ivy League colleges, um, the percentage of Asian enrollment at these colleges had stagnated in recent years. So what I did was to, to basically update those numbers for another 10 years because the, the, those, that information was getting older. And I also um, went through and tried to classify colleges a little more systematically so we can see how trends look at different types of colleges. And in doing this work, you did have some interesting findings about what has happened with this enrollment. Yeah, yeah. So first of all, the uh, I, I confirmed the, the previous uh, findings that uh, Asian enrollment did stagnate at really, really uh, elite colleges um, starting in about the mid 90s and going through most of the 2000s. Um, the other interesting thing I found, though, is that um, in, over the last decade or so, uh, Asian enrollment has started going up at a lot of places as well. Um, and sometimes that looks like it started a little bit before the lawsuits. Sometimes it looks like it might in part be a reaction to those lawsuits. Um, but it's, it's, very, it's very interesting that right around the time that people started really making noise about this and really pushing to do something about it um, is when the trend started changing again. You found some interesting patterns in looking at these uh, data, and one of them was something involved uh, with fanning out. Tell us how that plays a, a factor here. Sure. I mean, well, basically what you see if you look at data on academic achievement is that there are racial gaps in academic achievement and uh, Asian students in particular do really well. They tend to outscore other students uh, by a number of metrics. Um, the thing is, if, if you look just at the average student, this isn't, a, this isn't a categorical difference. It's not like if you pick a random Asian student and a random non-Asian student that you're guaranteed that the Asian student is going to be far and away a better student. Um, and, and when you have uh, basically differences at, at the average, where there's a little bit of a difference in the average, you tend to have much bigger differences at what are called the extremes of the distribution statistically. So if you have a small difference in the average, what you all often find is that if you look only at the student who are the most academically advanced, you're going to find a much bigger difference. So you find that, for example, um, in both the Harvard lawsuit and in the DOJ's investigation of Yale, they actually found that if you look at just the top 10% of applicants by their academic indexes, um, if, either student, if either school basically just chose people, uh, applicants from the top 10%, they would actually be majority Asian. So that's, that's a very extreme skew because Asians are only about 6% of the college age population, but there are a majority of people with extremely high academic credentials who are applying to Harvard and Yale. So basically what you see over time is when a population like that grows, you have, you know, the overall population might only go from three to 6%. That's not, not such a big deal. But when you have, you know, such extreme differences, you can be talking about, um, uh, basically there's a fanning out pattern where the, the overall percentage might only go from three to 6%. But other percentages of the distribution are going to go much higher. If Asians were already, say, 10% at some percent of the distribution, uh, some you know, set of applicants to some school, they're going to be much higher. You could be looking at popul populations that are 20, 30% Asian. Um, and that's where I think a lot of schools start to balk. They start to say, you know, we want you know, our demographics to look like that because they're concerned about racial proportionality. One of the things that's interesting about these cases is that both of them involve very elite schools. Harvard, of course, everyone knows that Harvard is elite. For those who are not as familiar with the University of North Carolina, it is considered one of the top public universities. And certainly uh, here in North Carolina, we claim it as the oldest public university in the country. Uh, your research shows some difference in the way that the elite schools treated the Asian American applicants than other schools that was, that was worth noting. 
Yeah, there's there basically you see very different trends at different types of schools. At, at schools that are not very selective, you see the expected pattern um, where the Asian population grows over time. You know, the Asian population was growing over time over this time period. Um, schools that started out, say, you know, three or six percent Asian tended to they, they saw their Asian population rise. Um, it's at the very elite schools where they were already at, say, you know, 15 percent Asian already by the mid 90s. That's where you see this stalling out in the enrollment. Um, one thing I would note about um, Chapel Hill specifically that, that I think is kind of interesting is that it, its Asian population actually has grown. And there was a recent study out by uh, Peter Arcidiacono and two researchers, two other researchers, um, showing that um, at, at that school, at least, there does not appear to be a lot of discrimination against Asian Americans, at least relative to white students. There's, there's still affirmative action there where they're preferring Black and Hispanic students, um, but they do not appear to be discriminating against Asians uh, relative to white students, unlike what, what they find out. As you were moving forward with this, so you make great pains to note that you're looking at data, you're not finding particular uh, evidence for or against discrimination. Is that right? Yeah, basically what I'm doing is tracking the trends and people can look at those trends and, and ask themselves whether they make sense. Um, it's very difficult to say what's going on at any particular school unless you have the kind of data that, that these lawsuits shook out. Um, and that's very private because it contains a lot of information on individuals. Given what you did find, are there any significant implications for the cases? Will, will your data help inform arguments one way or the other? Well, that, that, that's, uh, that would be flattering if it happened. Um, I, I think the thing is that the, these are cases that are against specific schools with a lot of specific data on those schools. And I think that's really what you need to do to prove that a specific actor is discriminating, is have really detailed information about what they're doing and what they're finding. Whereas what I'm showing is more of a bird's eye view of what's happening in schools in general. Um, so I, I think, um, I think, I think what, what I've done here is to provide sort of a, a roadmap um, of what's going on in schools in general that hopefully will be helpful to people as we move forward after these cases just so that they can look at which other schools we might need to, to as people consider this issue moving forward, based on your research and, and what you've seen with the actual data, what do the data tell us about what these schools are, are doing in terms of dealing with the, the, the growing number of Asian American applicants and the fact that uh, that tends to affect the highest end of the spectrum, the, the people with the highest scores? I, mean, I think the, the very most elite colleges are dealing with a situation where if they applied the same criteria to everybody and focused heavily on academics, you know, of course, what makes these, what distinguishes these schools is that, that, that they're so selective academically, they would have uh, pop, you know, student populations that are extremely highly Asian, you know, really extreme oral representation. Um, and they basically have to ask themselves whether that's something they're okay with, or if, or if having too many Asian students is going to cut into, you know, the, their ability to let in other students. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of us um, on the right would say that you should just use your criteria and be fair and not discriminate by race. But I think a lot of schools want to cultivate, you know, a certain type of diversity. They want to have a certain breakdown in their schools that reflects the population in general. And I think that's a, a real trade-off that they're having to struggle with. Um, you know, again, I can't prove that any specific school is discriminating in any specific way, but I think the trade-off that they're making is pretty clear. Given what the numbers show, uh, is this going to be a, a tough case, do you think, for the Supreme Court? I mean, you, you don't see signs of clear cut discrimination based on your data, but uh, this, this might be something difficult for them to decide. <clears throat> oh, I, I think the Supreme Court, I, I think the Supreme Court is actually going to dodge the Asian question. I, I think this is going to be a, a rethinking of, of affirmative action more fundamentally. These schools don't deny that they have affirmative action policies. They don't deny that they use race as a plus factor for, um, for uh, you know, black and Hispanic students. I think this is going to be a complete rethinking of the affirmative action landscape. Um, but, but that said, you know, again, these are these are lawsuits against two specific schools, and there is a, a record on both of those schools that's much more detailed on those on just those schools than I have on schools in general. So I think there's plenty of room for the Supreme Court to do what it wants to do with the, the more extensive data it has on just those two schools. Well, the topic is very interesting and some new information now available that has at least some relation to what the U.S. Supreme Court is going to be considering later this year. The research, once again, is titled Trends in Asian Enrollment at U.S. Colleges. Its author is Robert Verbruggen. He is a fellow at the Manhattan Institute. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. 